Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. This is Lecture 5 in Week 3. This week we've been talking about quality assurance and quality control. And one of the most important measures you can take when you do a measurement, especially a quantitative measurement, is to use an internal standard. And that's what we'll be talking about in today's lecture. So before we get into that, I want you to think about the magic box. And for the purpose of this analogy, we're going to be thinking about the atomic absorption spectrometer. So in an atomic absorption spectrometer, you've got a couple of processes that go on before you actually take the measurement of absorption that can really influence how much sample actually ends up in the path length of the light. One thing you have to do is nebulize your sample, turn it into a spray of little tiny droplets. And if you have too many big droplets out of that spray, then they never evaporate and you never get them into the flame. And they just flow through the gas in the system and they're gone forever. And in fact, in AAS spectrometers, you may only sample 2 to 3 percent of the total sample you're putting in. So that nebulizer doesn't make constantly the same droplets. Sometimes there are bigger ones, sometimes there are smaller ones, and so you can actually get a change in the sampling efficiency just from the nebulizer. Maybe a more intuitive example is the flame itself. Any flame flickers. There's always a variation in the energy of a flame. And what happens in an AES system is that sometimes the flame's running slightly hot, and then the next second it might be lower, and then the next second it might be hotter. It's the flicker that we're used to seeing in any kind of fire. And what that means is that the sampling efficiencies, even if you've done everything perfect, are not going to be the same trial to trial. So the magic box isn't going to be perfect. One trial, you might get one amount of silver. The next trial, you might see a little bit more in the signal. OK, so let's say you're working at a company. And you've been asked to analyze toy phones in particular from Finland. You have a new batch in. And the company would very much like to sell them, but they have to test them. So they ask you to check out how much lead is there. And they don't want to sell any phone that has more than 90 ppm lead, for obvious reasons. So you go and you run the really common, you digest the samples, you run them in flame AAS because you have a large lead concentration, and that's the instrument of choice. And you get this data set shown here over seven trials. And as you can see, there's a lot of sc scatter in that data set. And the problem is that the average of your values is almost identical to the regulatory value. And in fact, if you took the standard deviation and you applied the 95% confidence limit um, test we talked about in the first week, you actually couldn't tell me if your toy phones have more than 90 ppm lead or less. So you can't answer the question that you were really asked to answer because of the problems with the precision of the measurement. It's too imprecise. The values have too much of a spread. So you might say, what do you do? Well, OK, you might remember that the random error is going to scale with 1 over the square root of n, where n is the number of measurements. So a young chemist might say, I'm going to take 100 measurements, and then I'll have a much smaller error bar, which is correct. The problem is, in the real world, that often takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money. And your boss wants to know if the toys are good to go in like a day. So you don't really have time to do 100 measurements. You've got to come up with some other way to deal with the random error that's present in your signal. So let's think a little bit about what might be going on in the machine over these seven trials. In trial one, maybe the flame was running a little bit hotter. So you detected more lead because you had a better sampling efficiency. And then in the second one, maybe the nebulizer made too many big drops that didn't evaporate before they hit the flame. And in trial three, it's high again for a number of reasons. So what can you do to fix this? Well, it turns out, imagine we can do multi-element detection on the AAS, which you can if you have another arm to it. Some, some instruments do. And you can measure copper that was present in your samples at the exact same time. So let's say you took all of your lead trial samples and you spiked them with 10 ppm copper. So you added a known amount of copper. Shouldn't do anything to the lead. But you can detect it, assuming that you have an ability to do that. And when you do that, you see that the same random errors that made your lead, error, lead numbers a little high also made the copper numbers a little high. And likewise, let's say in trial two, the nebulizer wasn't making too big of droplets. So guess what? The copper data is low and the lead data is low. So by running an internal standard at the same time you do your primary measurement, you're going to be able to sort of get a, the fluctuations mirrored in the internal data set internal standard data set. And if you divide the lead by the copper, something pretty magical happens. Because when the lead number is high and the copper number is high, if you divide that lead number by a big number, you bring it down. In trial two, the lead number is a little low. You're dividing it by a smaller number, so you're boosting it. So the internal standard is kind of like a volume knob. 
that tells you, oh, we got to take this one down. Oh, we got to take this one up. Oh, we got to take this one down. And thereby, the ratio ends up becoming the parameter that you actually calibrate against and calculate the error on. And that ratio, even though it's a ratio, you can immediately get back to the concentration of lead if you know the concentration of copper you put in. Remember, that's not an unknown. That's a fixed number that we set up. So what kinds of stuff would you use an internal standard? I mean, what, how would you pick it? The single most important thing about an internal standard is that it be analyzed as close in time as you possibly can to your analyte. Shown here on the left is a chromatogram, we'll talk about that next week, in which in time two different analytes came out and the 6.65 retention time analyte is in fact the internal standard. And you'll notice we chose it to be very close in time, retention time to 7.78. You can also think through other factors, like in mass spectrometry. One of the big, big issues in random error there is that you don't necessarily ionize all of your atoms. It's sometimes hard to rip electrons or donate electrons to atoms. So you want to pick something with a very similar ionization potential. Uh, in the case of AAS or AES, you want to pick a metal, if you're doing metals analysis, that has a very similar oxidation potential. The oxidation of metals can be one way in which your sampling efficiencies are lowered. So you really need the random error present on your analyte and your standard to be similar. But remember, your internal standard cannot be your analyte because then you don't get that separate channel of information that lets you know whether you should turn up the volume or turn down the volume when sort of correcting your data for the random fluctuations that are present. Now, mathematically handling internal standards may look a little bit tricky. So I'm going to describe it abstractly here, and then we'll do a problem. So shown to the left is a classic calibration curve. And you can see that the lead is increasing in signal as we increase the concentration of the lead in solution. Now, the internal standard is almost certainly going to have a different instrument response function. In this case, it's smaller. But nevertheless, both of them should be described by linear calibration curves, as shown here. Now, if you divide both of these equations, any one equation divided by another is going to also give you a true equality. You're going to get something like this. And what you can see is on the right-hand side, there's something that I call the F factor, which is the ratio of the instrument response functions of both the internal standard and the analyte. And that ratio is a fixed number. And then on the other side, you see four different parameters, many of which are going to be important to us, the analyte signal, the internal standard signal, the analyte concentration, usually what we're solving for, and the internal standard concentration, which of course we're going to know. You always are very, very quantitative about how much internal standard you add. You write that down so that at the very end of the calculation, you can end up with the analyte concentration because that ratio, of course, you just multiply by the concentration of IS and you're off to the races. This is a more typical form for seeing an internal standard calibration. And the only thing I'd point out is it looks a lot like what we've seen already. Signal is equal to a constant times the concentration. But the primary difference is the signal here is the ratio of the signal of the analyte to the internal standard. And of course, you're going to get a ratio of the concentration of the analyte to the internal standard. That was pretty abstract. So let's try to work with a concrete example. Take a moment, maybe stop the lecture and read this problem. And then I'm going to go through it step by step. So question A is a pretty easy question. What we're doing is we're taking a known system. So we're getting information in the first sentence that tells us what the F factor is. It's actually able to tell us the response function of both of those entities. And so what we did in this case is we took that information, but then we went ahead and added a mil of the standard, which is S, to a mil of the unknown. And that's what we measured. So the first thing I've asked you to do is just calculate the concentration of the internal standard in the second solution. So we use our good old M1B1 divided by V2, and we calculate a concentration of 0.847 millimolar. The second part of this question is, what's the concentration of the analyte in that second mixture? OK, so let's find the F factor. There's the equation that we started with on the last page. Now, we and put in the data from this experiment. Now, all of this data came from the first sentence. You can see 3.47. We just plugged in all the data given to us in that first sentence. And we calculated an F factor of 0.168. Now we're going to apply the formula a second time, except now it's going to be to the unknown situation. And so here we're going to be solving for the ratio of the analyte to the standard. And then we know the F factor. That stays the same. We just plug in two new signals, that of the analyte and that of the internal standard. And we get a number of ratio of 7.29. Now, luckily for us, back up here in part A, we calculated the concentration of S in this solution.
So it's a relatively easy thing then to calculate the concentration of the analyte. Here it is. And finally, to get to the concentration of the analyte in the original unknown, we have to correct for the dilution. And that's, again, a very straightforward calculation. Now, if you have an Excel sheet and you're trying to do a slope line kind of formal treatment of a calibration um, problem, the internal standard is invaluable because it's going to lower greatly the error that's on your calibration. So here's a data set shown on the left, which shows you the weight percent of copper in a mass spec signal. You don't have a lot of data points here, and they're super noisy. In fact, the R squared of this line is 0.917, which is almost, I usually throw anything out below about 0.9. But it's a pretty bad calibration data set. And in fact, the RSD number shown here is the error that we calculated for SX0 when we applied this to the unknown of 58.9. So it's got a 20% error in the unknown concentration. Let's try using an internal standard. So in this data set, what I've done is I've given you an internal standard signal. And that internal standard signal has now, so the thing that we're going to calibrate against is going to be the mass spec signal ratio for the weight percent copper divided by the internal standard signal that we got during the same experiment. So it's this new column of data that becomes our Y values, that when you calibrate in this fashion, the RSD or the random error goes down substantially. So we really cleaned up the data by including this internal standard. And it's a very important process to think about because when you do this calibration, you need to be able to almost always calculate a new set of Y values, which is the, con which is the, mat the signal of your analyte at a set of concentrations divided by the signal of your internal standard at those same concentrations. In any case, typically internal standards greatly clean up your data. And in the case that I started off with, what that would allow you to do, of course, is be able to answer the question, across your seven trials, do you have toys that have more than 90 ppm lead in them? And in this case, I haven't run the full t-test for you. You can see that probably you're going to be just, just barely under the regulatory limit. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.